An analogue car for the digital age, Toyota's GR86 is one of the very last combustion-powered affordable new sports cars that Europeans will get to enjoy. It's a worthy evolution of its much-loved GT86 predecessor, but with stiffer suspension, sharper steering and a smarter look both inside and out. Otherwise, things are as before. Developed and desired by enthusiasts, the GR86 remains a benchmark in the compact coupe sector, a masterclass in driving dynamics. If you thought involving affordable sports cars belonged back in history, then you'll find Toyota's GR86 a welcome breath of fresh air. For too long, enthusiasts believed what the car makers told them, that they needed more power, more grip, more fancy intervening electronics. That argument looks good on paper, but can often be curiously unsatisfying out on the road. If that's been your experience in buying an affordable and enthusiast orientated but practical sports car, then you might agree that it's time to go back to basics. And that is exactly what Toyota did when back in 2012, it launched what was known in Japan as the Hachiroku model, which translates as 8.6 in Japanese. We knew it as the GT86. Four factors governed its development, light weight, modest, normally aspirated power, rear wheel drive and narrow tires. Lap times, the engineers decided, were unimportant. What mattered here was driving enjoyment. You might have forgotten just how much of a heritage affordable Toyota sports cars have in providing that. From the tiny S800 of 1962 to the GT2000 later that decade and the Celica of the 70s and the mid-engine MR2 of the 80s and 90s. The GT86 proved to be a worthy successor to these cars, but there's always room for improvement, which in 2022 led to the next chapter in this model line, this car, the GR86. The change of letter designates the development involvement of Toyota's motorsport division, Gazoo Racing, the engineers who brought you the GR Supra and the GR Yaris. Now, as with the old GT86, this GR model has been produced as part of a joint venture with Subaru. It's even built at Subaru's Gumma plant, and like its predecessor, gets a Subaru-style flat-four engine, though now a larger one. This time round, there won't be any Subaru versions of this design for our market, and there won't be any more GR86s either which will be a problem if you like this car because the entire UK allocation sold out at launch in a matter of minutes and the Japanese brand isn't building any more for Europe. All of which will make this Toyota a guaranteed collector's item. But just how special is it? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. So what's it like? Well, pushing the GR start button delivers opening instrument cluster screen graphics that build the GR logo and animate the outline and piston stroke of the boxer engine up front. The metallic thrum from which is familiar despite Toyota's efforts to subtly refine it. That, the low set driving position and the slightly heavier feel to the clutch deliver the immediate impression of a proper sports car and one designed to be driven hard. The kind of thing you might have thought had been legislated out of existence at this price point. The GR86 sets out to prove otherwise. Can it deliver? Its GT86 predecessor did. That car traded as much on its imperfections as its attributes. Yes, you had to rev the normally aspirated two litre flat four within an inch of its life to keep up with eager hot hatches. But when you did, the raw gravelly engine note was addictive. True, the ride over poor surfaces was unyielding, but wasn't that to be expected from a race refugee? Certainly the cabin was spartan, but felt all the more authentic because of it. With the GR86, all these flaws remain recognisable, but each issue has been subtly finessed to make it easier to live with. It's a masterly piece of evolution. 
you'll be wanting to know about the fundamental updates here. Well, the headline change is an increase in the size of the Subaru developed four cylinder power plant to 2.4 litres. That's boosted maximum output by 17% from 197 to 231 bhp which of course makes this Toyota a touch faster. The 62 mile an hour sprint cut by over a second to 6.3 in this manual model en route to 140 miles an hour. There's a bit of a hit to those stats if you choose the alternative paddle shift six speed automatic, where if you select that auto's added sport mode, the figures are 6.9 seconds and 134 miles an hour. More significant though on any GR86 is the increase in torque up from 205 to 250 newton meters and particularly the fact that this time round you don't have to thrash the thing up to 6,000 rpm to access it. Peak pulling power now available from a stress-free 3,700 rpm making overtaking so much easier though still not as instant as a turbo motor would offer. So much else is also different here beneath the bonnet. Toyota's contribution to this rejuvenated FA24 series Subaru power plant, the D4S fuel injection system now completely redesigned. As have been the intake manifold port, the inlet valves, the fuel pump and the radiator. You'd think a bigger, better kitted out engine would mean more weight, especially as its installation has been accompanied by a whole raft of fundamental stiffening measures that together have increased body rigidity by up to 60% at the front and 50% at the rear. But no, copious extra use of aluminium and some clever detail power plant changes have combined to actually shave 10 kilos from the curb weight this time round. So this car's trademark agility has been preserved intact. So has the four-cylinder unit's distinctive growl, augmented by a larger exhaust and an active sound control system that transmits its melody through a dedicated speaker in the centre of the instrument panel. As you'd expect, this orchestral feedback varies should you select the more focused track drive mode option, something that was added to the updated version of the previous generation model and has been carried forward here, complete with a bespoke instrument cluster rev display. Selecting track minimises the stability control system's interference to the point where you hardly feel it, but keeps the VSC operable just in case ambition get the better of talent on slippery surfaces. You'd expect that tortoise chassis and this car's continuing status as the lightest four-door sports car on the market to tell around the twisty stuff too. Held by a near optimum 53 to 47% front to rear weight balance and a ride height drop by 10 millimeters, which has given this Toyota the lowest center of gravity in its segment. Sure enough, if you're minded to take this GR86 by the scruff of the neck, you'll find it'll attack turn apexes like a shark turning towards a meal, aided by retuned shock absorber damping and coil spring characteristics, and by the effective rear Torsen limited slip differential carried over from the previous model. You feel all the more involved too, thanks to a recalibrated electric power steering system that clues you into traction with extra feel and a more closely stacked set of gear ratios accessed on this manual model by a redesigned stick with a shorter, more precise stroke working via a bigger clutch. But what of the old GT86's trademark penchant for a tail-happy power slide delivered courtesy of skinny Michelin Primacy tyres borrowed from a Prius? Well, that rubber option no longer exists for our market, though it can still be had in others. Toyota's UK importers insisting on the fitment of grippier Michelin Pilot Sport 4 rubber to tame that tendency. It's still there, though, partly because the 215 section tyre width is no wider. You just have to be going a bit faster to instigate it, or or have taken to a track where you can adjust your cornering line with your right foot in a way that other comparable sports coupes could only dream about and in a GR86 you can do all that safe in the knowledge that there's a limited slip differential and an advanced stability control system to gather things up in extremis along with a beefier set of brakes Ultimately, that's perhaps the best thing about this car, the way that it's been engineered to please both performance driving novices and experts alike, which isn't an easy trick to pull off.
If you happen to be familiar with this model's predecessor, then you'll recognise the GR86 at once because the design formula is much the same. As with the GT86, a mere glance at this car might leave you wondering what all the fuss is about. The styling remains smart, but hardly show-stopping, with classic front-engine, rear-drive proportions delivering a long bonnet and a rear-set cabin. Toyota says the design concept here is inspired by functional beauty, which means everything you can see is based around taming the tarmac. You sit closer to it too in a GR86 because the ride height's been lowered by 10 millimetres. Design details reference great Toyota sports cars of the past, like the 2000 GT, and as before, there's powerful front and rear wing treatment, along with short overhangs that add to the agile look. Plenty of detail differences set the GR86 apart, though. These curved, more aerodynamic black door mirrors, the fully functional air vents behind the front wheels, and rear arches now pulled in more tightly, emphasising the wide stance. These 18-inch matte black alloy wheels shod with stickier Michelin Pilot Sport 4 rubber, feature slim blade-like spokes apparently inspired by a Japanese sword motif. The front, though, is where you'll notice most of the differences over the old GT86, primarily because of these new parabola-shaped Jaguar F-type-like steering responsive LED headlights, which have an internal L-shaped arrangement like those on the GR Supra. The front bumper has a smarter textured moulding that helps to reduce drag and sits just above a low-set grille with a GR-exclusive G-motif mesh pattern. The low-rising bonnet, meanwhile, covers cylinders with a bore expanded from the perfectly square 86mm dimension of the previous model. That figure is now 94mm. The rear is different too. It's three-dimensional light clusters blending into a garnish that runs along the width of the car. Fins added to the rear wheel arches and aero fins on the lower rear bumper help control the airflow over and away from the car's body, aiding stability. There's also this ducktail spoiler on the boot and the license plate has been moved lower, now integrated into the bumper. Another detail in the drive for a lower centre of gravity. Larger, potent-looking exhausts sit in the diffuser just below. As usual, though, the key differences are things that you can't see. The entire body has been stiffened with a considerable amount of undercar bracing, plus the roof and front wings are now made of aluminium, contributing to an overall weight reduction of 10 kilos, which is impressive given the extra safety and collision protection features now added. The aluminium roof alone saves a couple of kilos, allowing this car to tip the scales at a relatively feather light, 1,260. 75 kilograms, enough to make it the lightest four-seat sports car on the market, as well as the one with the lowest centre of gravity. Right, time to take a look inside. Now, if there's one thing you didn't buy the old GT86 for, it was a high-quality cabin. In that old car, the interior was reasonably well-made and supremely driver-focused, but it was also plasticky and rather basic. So, what are we being served up here? Something a lot less dated looking, but still recognisably of this model line. If you own the old car, the main changes you'll notice relate to the much larger screens, an 8-inch monitor in the centre of the dash, and in place of the previous analogue dials, a digitalised 7-inch multi-information display in the instrument binnacle. But you'd also quickly pick up on the fact that the required step forward in quality has indeed materialised. Yes, it's still a bit plasticky and you certainly wouldn't think you were in any kind of premium brand environment. But the seat upholstery is now a pleasing combination of genuine leather and race style ultra suede. And all the main things your hands and elbows touch have been softened, padded and improved in quality. More important, though, than any of this is that the previous model's very connected feel between driver and car has been retained. Indeed, it's been improved upon, given that you now sit 5mm lower than you did in the GT86. Your view forward, though, is still fine, aided by a horizontally configured instrument panel that gives a wide field of vision and helps you focus on the business of driving. 
An old school conventional handbrake has been retained and the leather stitched three spoke wheel still feels great to hold, incorporating integrated switches for frequently used functions. Audio and phone controls to the left with meter operation and voice recognition to the right. The wheel on the automatic model gains black cast metal gear shift paddles. Through it, you view the more focused digitalized instrument cluster we mentioned earlier, created in a design style first seen on the GR Supra. When driving normally, it's based around a single dial rev counter with incorporated speed readout. This central gauge flanked by temperature and fuel readouts to the right and a multi-information display screen to the left, whose contents, things like a G-force readout, tyre pressures, a torque graph and meters for battery charge and oil temperature, can be selected, reset and scrolled using switches on the steering wheel. Select the wild track setting and the centre gauge disappears entirely, replaced by a completely different layout that's been designed with help from Toyota Gazoo Racing's professional drivers. This shows engine RPM in an escalating central bar display, plus speed and a prioritised lap timer along with oil and water temperatures. Staying with screens, this driver angled centre monitor is at last a proper size and incorporates much greater CPU computing power along with the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring system you couldn't have on the old car. Which is just as well since built-in navigation can't be fitted even as an option. It comes with proper rotary knobs and useful shortcut flanking buttons. Plus there's also the stuff you really need, Bluetooth, a six speaker DAB tuner, a built-in reversing camera and a home screen that'll see you regularly using just the top four options, radio, media, phone and apps. It's all touchscreen controlled, there's no voice activation and you also do without the kind of useful lower rotary controller for screen activation that you get on a rival Mazda MX-5, though that car has a smaller 7-inch central display. But there's a Wi-Fi function and also a useful feature we've seen on no other car. The facility to store birthday and anniversary dates for friends and family. Someone in the development team clearly thought that was important. More that's new resides above and below this screen. New shape squarical air vents above for better direction control and spread of airflow. And below the monitor, these three twinkling circular Audi-like red LED digital displays for the climate system, controlled by five silver piano-style keys that sit just below in front of the gear stick. We mentioned the seats earlier. They're completely new, reshaped with a frame that's three kilos lighter and independently supportive pads that hold you in place and are more comfortable on longer journeys. The suede trimmed door cards are a lot nicer too with reshaped leather stitched armrests. Extra practicalities have been considered too, which is why the glove box is 25% bigger and a bottle holder now resides in the door panel. Plus overhead front map lights and courtesy lamps in the lower edge of the doors have also been installed. And this central box between the seats doubles as an armrest though if you use it as such. It can be easy to accidentally activate the twin lidded opening button with your elbow. Inside there are holders for small cups and bottles, plus you get two USB ports and an AUX socket. Not everything that could have been improved has been though. There's still limited steering wheel adjustment, which means taller folk will often either find themselves either too close to the wheel or to the pedals. And an overhead sunglasses compartment still doesn't feature. At least all round visibility is fine, aided by a large rear window and big door mirrors. Right, that's briefed you on the front of cabin experience. Now, unlike its closest competitor in spirit, Mazda's MX-5, this remains a two plus two. So as with the GT86, you get a tiny pair of seats in the back. Has this GR86's five millimeter wheelbase increase done anything to make them more usable? Well. A walk-in release lever on the front seat shoulder is supposed to make accessing the rear easy. But you still clamber in with a minimum of dignity. 
Now, thanks to these little quarter light windows, it's not too claustrophobic back here, but if you were hoping to find the almost adult usable pews that you're favoured with in a rival BMW 2 Series Coupe, you'll be disappointed because these are much more cramped. The sort of chairs that motoring journalists without small children usually moan about, but we actually find really useful, if only for putting your jacket on. If you want to actually use these chairs for people, they'd better be of school age because almost any adult is going to find themselves seated with their head uncomfortably jammed against the ceiling. Even worse, if the occupant up front is of more than average height, you'll have virtually no legroom at all. We'll finish as usual with a look out back. Now the boot lid is now easier to use and opens higher. Disappointingly though, luggage capacity has fallen from 243 litres in the GT86 to 226 litres here. That's despite the fact that this GR86 does without the previous model's useful space saver spare wheel, which is annoying because lifting the cargo base reveals that there'd be room for it without the compartmentalised container that now resides under the floor, containing the fiddly replacement tyre repair kit. Still, the capacity on offer in the main boot area is better than the feeble 130-litre compartment you'd get in an MX-5, though in a different realm from the spacious 390-litre boot of a BMW 2 Series Coupe. Annoyingly, there are no bag hooks or tie-down points, and there's quite a high lip to lump your luggage over. On the plus side, the light inside the boot has been made brighter and moved to the centre so that it's easier to check items and luggage at night. If you need more room and want to drop the 50-50 split rear backrests, you might expect to use these provided black pull straps, but they don't appear to work or be useful for much. So you've got to go around to the release catches on the rear seat shoulders. With everything almost flat, there's quite a lot more room to play with, though not quite as much as before. With the old car, Toyota claimed that racers and track day types could use this cargo area to accommodate a trolley jack and four replacement wheels and tyres. This time round, we reckon you'd have to lose the trolley jack. There's only one version of this design offered this time round. You may remember that with the old GT86, Subaru, who still build this Toyota, offered their own version of it called the BRZ. And they still do, though unfortunately we can't buy the new generation version of that model here. You're going to struggle to buy a GR86 as well, or at least you will if you haven't already got your name on Toyota's waiting list with a deposit paid. If not, you can probably skip this section, given that you can't and almost certainly won't be able to acquire one of these new. The official asking price from launch was £30,000 for a manual model, with a £2,100 premium added for versions with the alternative six-speed auto gearbox. These kinds of figures are still higher than is ideal for a car supposed to bring younger buyers back to the mark, but by segment standards, they're very good value indeed, explaining why the initial UK allocation of around 430 cars sold out in a matter of minutes back at the end of 2020, aided by Toyota marketing suggesting that when they're gone, they're gone. This referenced the fact that the GR86 will only actually be officially on sale here and on the continent until July 2024. It's a victim not of emissions rulings, apparently that's not an issue, but of oncoming EU safety legislation requiring camera safety features that can't be incorporated into this car's distinctive low-slung bonnet without a prohibitively far-reaching redesign. Which is frustrating because without that, the car could theoretically have stayed in Toyota showrooms until 2030, the date from which all sales of new combustion models are supposed to be banned. Other world markets don't have to adopt this draconian legislation, so the GR86 will stay on sale globally long after European production dries up, which means we can expect a thriving little trade to spring up in personal imports. Otherwise, 
Unless the UK importers manage to hoover up any cars that go unsold in Europe and point them in our direction, which seems unlikely, your best bet, if you're new to the prospect of acquiring a GR86, is to pay the inevitable premium that late, low-mileage versions of this model will command on the used market. If you're forced into doing that, then console yourself with the fact that even if the seller in question is more than ordinarily greedy, you'll still probably be paying less than you would for a conventional sports coupe in this segment. The base version of BMW's rear-driven 2 Series coupe, the 220i, is the car that most readily springs to mind, but that offers only 184 horsepower, 47 horsepower less than a GR86. Can only be had with an auto gearbox, and at the time of this test cost nearly £37,000. A 230i coupe would more accurately match this Toyota's performance, but for one of those, you'll need well over £40,000. At the time of this test in early 2023, Audi's front-driven TT Coupe was still on sale, priced from around £34,000 in base 40 TFSI form, but again only available in auto form and really much less of an enthusiast's choice. We haven't yet mentioned the car that more faithfully replicates what Toyota's trying to offer here, Mazda's MX-5. It's said that Tetsuya Tada, chief engineer of the original GT86, arranged to meet with the MX-5 engineering team when the GT86 was originally being developed. And certainly much of the joie de vivre we associate with the MX-5 made it into that earlier version of this coupe and has been carried through to this one. A 2-litre MX-5 costs about the same as a GR86, but, like the 220i, has a 47-horsepower output deficit and can't be had in conventional coupe form. With the MX-5, you have to have either a fabric folding roof or, for a couple of grand more, a folding metal retractable fastback top. In terms of your market options, that's about it, unless you're prepared to consider a Golf GTI-style hot hatch, which isn't really the same thing at all, or you happen to have well over £50,000 to blow on an enthusiast-orientated sports coupe like the Porsche 718 Cayman or the Alpine A110. In short, then, there's nothing quite like a GR86, but then you probably already knew that. What you might not be quite as up to speed with is just how much more generous Toyota's been with the equipment this time round. So, let's take a closer look at that. This GR86 model rides on smarter 10-spoke 18-inch alloys with a matte black finish. And all variants get LED technology for the adaptive headlamps, the daytime running lights and the tail lamps as well as key driving stuff that includes high-performance brake discs and pads, plus a limited slip differential for better cornering and start-off traction. Other standard features include auto headlights, cruise control, electric heated door mirrors with a folding function, chrome-tipped exhaust pipes and an alarm immobiliser. Unfortunately, the old GT86's proper Space Saver spare wheel has been swapped out for a tyre repair kit. Inside, you'll find heated sports seats trimmed in a combination of leather and ultra suede, the latter carried on onto the doors. There's also dual zone climate control and auto dimming rear view mirror, aluminium sport pedals, cruise control, a seven inch multi information display in the instrument cluster. Plus there's leather trim with contrasting stitching for the GR badge steering wheel, gear knob and handbrake and smart door scuff plates. Infotainment's provided by an eight inch multimedia display that now offers Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, plus the usual Bluetooth, USB and aux in connectivity, plus a six speaker stereo with a DAB tuner. Options are few. Basically, it's just metallic paint for £645 more or a choice of four pearlescent shades for £965 each. Ignition red, pearl white, sapphire blue pearl, or as in this case, electric blue. We'd hope to see built-in navigation and a tow bar for motorsport regulars who can't fit all their slicks in the boot feature at extra cost. But no, 
In other markets, it's possible to choose a base model featuring smaller 17-inch wheels shod with far less grippy Michelin Primacy tyres, which better facilitate Larry tail slides. On to safety. Now, we mentioned earlier that because of this car's low-slung nose, European safety regulations will quickly kill this GR86 off for our market. Regulators wanting all future models from the industry to have camera features like traffic sign recognition so they can eventually completely control the speed at which we all drive. That's one of the elements of the Safety Sense pack of radar and camera-driven technology that Toyota fits to its more mundane models but which can't feature here. Nevertheless, the GR86 does offer usefully more safety provision than its predecessor. Its body structure has impact absorbing elements to soak up and channel forces in the event of an impact. And at the front, a crush box structure has been adopted in front of the A pillar and the reaction support components. Torque box, upper front pillar and rocker panel have been strengthened, giving better performance in front overlap collisions. Side impact protection includes the use of high strength material around the cabin, a hot stamped steel placed door ring framework and door beam, plus a new inner frame structure with reinforced connections. A front stereo camera features too, constantly monitoring the road ahead, but it's a bit annoying to find that the choiciest features it facilitates are reserved only for the automatic gearbox model, namely a pre-collision autonomous braking system, lane departure alert and automatic high beam, as well as intelligent adaptive cruise control. All GR86s do get rear cross-traffic alert with brake assist, which will warn you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space, and if necessary, brake the car to avoid a collision. There's also a blind spot monitor to stop you from dangerously pulling out in front of another vehicle. And thanks to the centre screen's new data communications module, there's an e-call function that will alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location should the airbags go off in a crash. As for more mundane features, stuff carried over from the old GT86, well, as you'd expect, there's anti-lock brakes with brake assist for emergency stops that will be advertised to following motorists by automatically flashing the brake lights. Plus, there's a VSC Plus dynamic stability control system, this one with three modes, so you can lessen its intervention if you're feeling brave. Passive safety features include twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag. And there's hill start assist, a tyre pressure warning system, anti-whiplash head restraints, decoupling brake pedal mechanisms and ISOFIX child seat fixings on the two rear seats. Few cars launched in recent years have been aimed at the used market, quite like this car's GT86 predecessor. At that old model's 2012 original launch, Chief Engineer Tetsuya Tada went as far as urging Toyota to ensure that the early examples sold should move onto the used market as quickly as possible so that younger people might be able to buy them second-hand and customise them to their tastes. Tadasan rude the fact that the car had to be quite so expensive in the first place, but at the same time didn't want to compromise and make a half-baked product clearly built down to a cost. So it is with this GR86. It's not as affordable as some at Toyota would like, but the brand still hopes that when the used market eventually adopts sensible pricing for this car, a younger demographic will flock towards it. With that in mind, the Japanese brand is releasing all of this model's development plans to tuners and aftermarket equipment developers to help generate a momentum that it hopes will create a GR86 cult. But those worthy ambitions are going to have to be shelved for the foreseeable future. Thanks to the reasons we gave you in our market section, this Toyota is only going to appreciate in value over the short term. And in the long term, restricted supply will keep its residuals far above anything you could expect from a premium brand model in this segment. If you've previously jumped to the conclusion that something with a posh badge in this sector, say a BMW 2 Series Coupe, might be a safer home for your money, then it's time to think again.
Other running costs are aided by the relatively light 1,275 kilo curb weight, though not by as much as we were hoping. With either gearbox, this car returns 32.1 mpg on the combined cycle, with a CO2 reading of 200 grams per kilometre for the manual and 199 grams per kilometre for the automatic. That's not actually very good by segment standards. A manual Mazda MX-5 2.0-litre Roadster manages 40.9 mpg and 155 grams per kilometre, while an automatic BMW 220i Coupe returns 44.1 mpg and 144 grams per kilometre. What we would say is that unlike some high-performance hot hatches, the quoted fuel figures here are distantly achievable if you resist the temptation to loon around everywhere in your GR86. Every person we know who ran an old GT86 regularly reported averages of over 30 miles per gallon. And we know a few lead foots, we can assure you of that. What else? Well, the insurance industry takes a dim view of the kind of driver a GR86 is likely to attract and rates a manual gearbox model up at Group 45D, which is pretty ludicrous for a 2-litre £30,000 coupe with a modest 231 horsepower. Thanks to its extra camera safety features, the automatic version rates slightly more affordably at Group 39D. Thankfully, the after-sales care is as good as any conventional Toyota. All GR86s come with up to 10 years Toyota Relax warranty cover. And after an initial three years or 60,000 miles, owners can extend their car's warranty by a further one year or 10,000 miles each time they have their vehicle serviced at an authorised Toyota centre in line with its service schedule. Plus, as standard, GR86 customers get five years of pan-European roadside breakdown assistance, a three-year paint warranty and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. There's a dedicated My Toyota website that allows you to book a service online and Toyota has a fixed price servicing plan so you'll know in advance exactly how much any work will cost before you check into a dealer. You can also take advantage of the optional prepaid service plan that that dealer will offer a point of purchase. This enables owners to cover the cost of routine maintenance with monthly or one-off payments in advance. So the world's lightest and most engaging four-seat sports car continues to be a tempting proposition for driving enthusiasts. Of course, as before, it could be faster, grippier, quieter and of better quality inside, but to be honest, we wouldn't really want it to be. All of those things would dilute the very qualities that make this GR86 what it is. Sports cars always used to be this way, agile, low-powered and modestly rubbered. We had fun in them then, and we can have fun in this one now. The stiffer chassis is excellent, the controls are brilliant, the driving position nigh on perfect, and the new 2.4-litre engine is revvy, fun, and sounds a bit more exciting. If you always wanted a car of this kind and missed the opportunity to put your name down for this one, then worry not. A well-looked-after GR86 will be equally addictive as a used proposition in a few years' time. And unlike most other cars that achieve its extra dimension of handling ability, you'll be able to justify it practically too. And even attempt longer distances, thanks to the improved cabin refinement and extra appointments. The coming EV era will doubtless be more enlightened, but for car enthusiasts, it'll disappoint in all the areas that this Toyota delivers. The GR86, like its predecessor, is a sports car to savour. One of those rare machines that involves you so much that you don't need to be travelling at three-figure speeds to have fantastic fun. Factor in the affordable running costs and high residuals, and it becomes a very complete proposition indeed. In years to come, we think this model line will be fondly remembered. Enjoy it while you can. <laughs>